Good evening. You know, I was thinking about that scripture where the man said there's a great gulf between. I know which side I'm on, all right? Okay. All right. Anybody got a word of praise? It's been a beautiful day. We all can agree on that one. It's, this week has been beautiful. Man, just gorgeous weather. Yeah. You know, Jim was, uh, y'all you know, showed the picture. I don't guess I got it and you didn't. I can't believe that. They, uh, his son-in-law sent me a picture yesterday of uh, Waylon being bottle fed. And he's laying back in his hands like that right there. He, like he's waving at you. So I replied back to his dad and I said, what a ham. Just like his daddy, you know? So uh, that was a priceless picture. Okay. Yes, ma'am. That's right. That's right. That's one of the things I hope is coming out of this awkward season we're in, that uh, our relationship with each other is so important, and yet right now it's kind of limited, too, of how we can uh, express that. So uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, any prayer requests? Ben? Ben? Uh, yeah, I think Linda and then now him, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. We got a number of members that have uh, kind of self-quarantined of situations that they've been in, and hopefully it's all going to prove negative, but nonetheless, they, they've had to do that. They're good. They're good. His two daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They're doing good. They are. Dale and uh, Shirley. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you indeed for the gift of another day and allowing us to, Lord, witness, to experience there, Lord, your handiwork in such a pleasant time of the year. And we thank you for it. We thank you for the blessings, the praises that have just been uh, shared. We owe it all to you because the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. And uh, Lord, uh, I pray with my brothers and sisters tonight as our country is in the uh, very thick of this uh, time of election. And I believe, Lord, it's very proper for us as your people to pray for our leadership. And we do pray. Uh, Lord, we know so much is of an ulterior motive and so many things are done that's, well, Lord, it's, it's not honorable. But Lord, I, we do pray, give us leaders that we need. From president down, Lord, give us the leadership that we need as a nation. And this opening in the Supreme Court is very critical. And so we, we are asking, Lord, with your mercy, your grace, your favor, Lord, that these things might go in a, in a good way. And we pray for guidance and wisdom that, Lord, we'll seek to be salt and light in every way we can in a culture that is so desperately needing it. Thank you for the word we have this evening. It's a very plain word, very straightforward word, but it's an, a good word, it's a needed word that I need in my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, if you haven't already, open your Bibles to Genesis, book of Genesis chapter 8. Genesis 8. Jeremy, Amanda, is tonight your first night? Yeah, okay. There was night and their uh, two four-year-olds are, are with us. Uh, Sophie, how about that? There's two Sophies in the building tonight. And, oh me, I forgot, I, three out of four. Ryan, excuse me, I'm sorry about that. I got caught up on Sophie, all right. Spelled the same way, too, not I-E. All right, do, do you recall, I, I'm sorry, Jim, I'm, I just have to move a little bit, but do you recall in uh, Matthew 6 how that the Lord said, consider the lilies, consider the sparrows? Well, you know, I guess got to make a confession night. I don't know the last time I did that, all right? And maybe you do, maybe you're more careful about that. 
But it's interesting, Jesus said, do that. Look at these things, consider these things. Well, tonight, I want you to consider with me the seasons. Because we have this uh, passage right here. It is after the flood and Noah and his family and all the animals have come off of the ark. And uh, Genesis 8, let, let's, let's read verse 20 to verse 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I've done. Now verse 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. I find it to be a very interesting statement that the Lord goes on record here to say that the seasons will continue. And so when you think about the Lord saying, consider the sparrows, consider the lilies, where the psalmist says, I behold your handiwork when I look at creation, whether it be looking up into the skies or looking across the landscape of the planet. The truth is, you know, year in and year out, we have this right before us. And yet how often do we actually stop and even think about it for a moment? That this, that, that God has ingrained into his creation and that it continues to happen. So I'm going to ask you tonight to, I've got uh, four propositions to make to you about this matter of, of the seasons. First of all, consider how the continuation of the seasons testifies to God's faithfulness. I mean, because the season, they're just there, you know, and it just keeps happening and keeps happening and keeps happening. And yet that's something about the faithfulness of our God. That think, go, go back all these centuries upon centuries upon centuries upon centuries upon centuries, way back then when God ordained this. And you know what? There's not a historical account where, oh, this year we didn't have any seasons. It just continues to happen. It's just there. And of course, I think it's, quite common in our human nature that, that that which we're around repeatedly, we just kind of are prone to kind of what? Just take it for granted, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know I'm that way. And so every now and then I can eat a little bit just for a reminder, a little wake up. But wait a minute, this, this is a part of the creator's work. Consider it for a moment. Look, there it is. Year in and year out, one season to the next. That's how your God is. That your God is faithful. Look on your paper, Isaiah 46. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am He. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and deliver you. Isn't that a great statement? The Lord is just reminding his people, look. There, there, there's a, a song that came out years ago now, but it said something to the effect, he was there all the time. And of course, you, you probably you know, heard or read, you know, the, 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 uh, I guess it's somewhat of a poem, but about the, you know, the, the sand dollars on the beach, you know, and, and the footprints and the sand and all that stuff. And that was actually was the Lord, not us, when there was only one set, that he was carrying us. But, you know, it is good every now and then to pinch ourselves and think of how faithful our God is to us. <coughs> Marine Corps has the motto what? Always faithful. Well, there's one that is truly always faithful. And that's our God. Remember, we just had the message on how the word of the Lord will be fulfilled. You see, the word is just like the one who speaks it, right? There, there is no friction between what he says and who he is. His word is an expression of his nature. And just as he is faithful, his word is faithful as well. So all through the years and all through the seasons, and sometimes a season can be tough, right? 
Terry and Candace was telling about their daughter-in-law. She was a, a missionary and then a pastor's uh, kid. And all her life, she'd either been in, in Africa or in Winston-Salem. But now they're in up, up, upstate New York. All right? Said this past winter wasn't all that strong. But you know, up there, they don't get inches of snow. They get yardsticks of snow, you know? And they really do up there, that, that lake effect up there. We, so, so some of those seasons can really be tough. Well, philosophically, if you will, some of the seasons of life are tougher than the others, aren't they? Well, but the truth is, in season and out of season, what? God is faithful. Amen? All right. Then also, through the years and in the midst of each season, God is faithful. Now look, 2 Thessalonians 3. But the Lord is faithful. You can always take any kind of phrase or subject or word, and those of you who use the internet, just toss that word in there and just find all these verses in the Bible about that particular subject. Well, here's a great subject where it is stated and restated again and again in the Bible, the Lord is faithful. Well, what about when I feel like maybe not in this case? You know what I'm saying? Who, who is, who's mixed up, the Word or me? That's not even a contest, is it? It's me, okay? I'm going by my feelings, by my observation. But the Lord is faithful in every season. Malachi 3, for, the Lord, for I am the Lord. I do not change. That's his immutability. I love that attribute of our God because that tells me all the other uh, characteristic attributes of God are going to remain also. He will always be who he is. Name it. Just, holy, powerful, all-knowing, you name it. He'll never lose one of those characteristics. And so he is faithful, always will be faithful. And see, that's what the seasons remind us of. Say, well, another spring, another summer, another fall, another winter. Oh, you know what? Another one, another one, another one, another one. Ever how many years you've been living, those seasons have continued. That's just like the one who made them. God is faithful. You might want to just maybe mark that somewhere sometimes. Because I'm telling you, when things can, can go differently and life gets really bumpy and as I recently, we had a lesson we had on when life piles on, when life piles on, and it can do that. I know some folks right now that life is piling on them. I won't tell you their stories, but I'm telling you, it's piling on them. What does the old uh, deceiver want to say? Uh -huh. Yea, hath God said... And the flesh will just warm up to that thought. And that's where we got to come back. What, how did Jesus refute the devil? Three times, remember? It is written, it is written, it is written. Okay. Secondly, not only the continuation of seasons, but consider how the changing of the seasons exemplifies God's mercy because we, we have four seasons and one turns into the next and think about that now, that thankfully the extreme periods in the seasons are temporal. Now, we don't have rough winters here. And I know folks who are from the north probably laugh at us. We get a half inch of snow. We cancel school. You know, we, we, you know we're, 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 DOT's out here putting out salt or whatever. You know, man, this is, this is serious business. Laugh at us. But what we do have is humidity. Uh, we do have that. And man, it had been nice. You could walk outside now and not just stand there and sweat. You know, you don't feel the heaviness of the air. You see, isn't that a good thing that it's not that way all year long? Aren't you glad it's not like, I, mean, I guess if you lived in the jungle, lived down around the equator, it's a different story. But thankfully here, we have those changing of the seasons. And I think that's too a good reminder of how the extreme situations in our life, thankfully, they're not forever. Now, I, I know when you're in the midst of something, it's crawling, it's dragging. It's like, when will it ever end? It will. One way or another, it's going to end. Here's, we, we just had this passage just a uh, couple of Wednesday nights ago. 
And, and we were in the study then where Paul said, remember he said twice, we do not lose heart at the beginning of the chapter, at the end of the chapter, 2 Corinthians 4. But at the end of that chapter, he says, it's for our light affliction, now note, which is but for a moment. Now, it doesn't seem like a moment. It seems like a millennium when you're in it. Paul is comparing with eternity. And there's no comparison. He says, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. The spiritual realm, that's forever. And so when you consider the seasons, they do change. That is from one to the next. Remind yourself, this extreme period you might be in right now, thank God for his mercy that it is not going to be always like that. And then also, the enjoyable periods in the seasons are encouraging. You see, you got something to look forward to. I, you know, I've, I've lived here all my life, and I have never got used to the humidity. That's the thing. But I, I, I dread that. I said, man, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And you know what? Can't do one thing about it. It's coming. Remember, we used to play tag when I was a boy. You remember somebody say, ready or not? Here I come. You know, that's humidity. But you can just look on the, over it a little bit and say, well, but there's coming the fall. Now, we, we're getting a little good taste right here in September this year. But man, those cool nights and cool mornings slows the grass down, doesn't it? When it starts getting cooler, you see? That's an encouragement. Well, we've had a good crop of grass this year. It has grown well. But man, it is nice when you cut it and you come back the next week and it's seeding out about that high, you know? We, we've got a piece over here where Sophie's parents live that we have to keep mowed now. And it's a fairly good-sized piece, but it's wide open. I mean, it's, it's really easy to mow it. Very, not too much weed except the ditch. you got to do it. But you've got them too, and we've got them. I don't know if DOT is the cause of it or not. But those things, when they come up, they're about like that. They grow overnight, I think. At least two days, three days, they're there. Tough, tough, like leather. I mowed one day when grass was still wet. I don't like the moment it's wet, but I had to. And man, you'd look back, pew, <laughs> they, would, they would lay down when you were mowing them, pop up when you went by. I was driving, somebody come by and said, that man is drunk. I was chasing them down, man, I was cutting them down. You know what? You got something to look forward to, man. That cooler weather comes, it puts a little crimp into their rapid growth. And then just the next thing you look forward to is what? Frost. We were up here with Sophie's brother yesterday where he has his little business. It was kind of late in the afternoon, it felt good. You know what that was, don't you? All around you, mosquitoes. And that's again where he said, man, look forward to frost coming. But of course, then after a while, so much of that, then we start saying, look forward to spring coming, you know? Us wimps down here in this uh, milder climate. But it is true, isn't it? it? There's something you've got to look forward to. You know, it starts getting cooler, the climate, cooler climate, cooler air, you know, they, they say that kind of, maybe lessens a little bit of the threat of a hurricane when you get into the cooler time of the year. So you're, looking for, you're anticipating something, right? Well, isn't that true for us in our relationship with the Lord? Paul in Philippians 1, he's writing from a prison. He says, for I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And he said, I'm tugged between my concern for you, but I tell you personally, it would be great to be with Jesus. See, he's looking forward to being with the Lord. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, writing to believers of Thessalonica, very likely some of them had had their loved ones to die, and there's the question about, hmm, what does this mean? They've died now. Jesus hadn't returned yet. What, what's involved here? How do we deal with this? He says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, and note Paul, it seems to imply here, he expected Jesus to come back in his lifetime. He said, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so, he, so he clarifies the situation there. They're okay. Don't worry about your loved ones who died in faith in Jesus. You're going to see them again. 
the Lord is coming back. We're going to be reunited. Now note the last verse. Therefore, comfort, or you can read there, encourage one another with these words. See? Hey, first century Christians went through some very fiery trials. Really did. We've had it very easy. They and many like them. Those for early centuries of the New Testament church. Horrendous suffering. As there is tonight around the world for some people. And yet Paul said, encourage them. We've got something to look forward to. Safe people do. Unsafe people don't. We've got something to look forward to. The best is yet to come. Amen? All right, there again on your paper. Look, Revelation 21. And, and, jo and uh, John is writing this, remember, from the Isle of Patmos. He's exiled for the cause of Christ. Very likely now the only apostle living. And he's writing to these churches in Asia Minor. He's, and he's gone through all the events that are coming and my, oh my, the judgment that will fall upon this planet. And yet, as he does in chapter 4 and 5, he's looking up to heaven. Here, now, again, he's, he's looking up. He said, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The seasons, thank the Lord, they're going to change. The seasons of suffering and sorrow down here, one of these days, one of these days, it's going to change because we're going to be with our Lord. And that, that reminds us of his mercy. He has something destined for his people that is so much better than what's down here. That's where Paul, in, in Paul in Romans 8, where he, he says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Wow. That'd be great, see. So, so we, we, we see the faithfulness of God that we still have seasons. We see the mercy of God in that seasons change. Oh, hot summer turns into wonderful fall and cold winters turn into springtime. The dormancy of winter turns into what? The budding, the blooming of spring. See, always something there that God is holding before us to say, be encouraged, be encouraged. That's how I'm going to do for you one of these days. I'll get you out of that extreme time of suffering and put you here with me. All right? Well, number three. Consider how the characteristics of the seasons symbolize God's purposes. Because every season has a purpose. Spring is not intended to be fall. Summer is not intended to be winter and vice versa. You see, in God's creation, there is a variety of purposes. Spring, it's a time to start breaking out. Man, those folks who, who would live up north, man, they might get cabin fever in the winter. But man, here comes springtime. Y'all ever, what was that movie my wife used to watch? Seven Brides, Seven Brothers, something like that, you know? They got trapped in for the winter, remember? But then the spring fall comes, you know? And man thinks, oh my see but there is a variety secondly there is a necessity to each purpose God does not give purposeless purposes there is a purpose for the seasons fall for harvest winter if you please for a rest spring time to break out and if you're the farmer, the gardener, to plow the land and get ready and seed to be sown. Summer, time to work it and till it. You see, there's a purpose, and it's necessary. We need it. Well, then there's a unity of purposes. You put them all together. They complement each other. One does not take away from the other, but one contributes to the other. All right? Now, Take that now and think about that in our lives. Well, first of all, God's purposes for our lives differ, 
right? We got, we got, a, we got a, a witness here tonight, a diverse group of people. And what God ordained for you was not necessarily what he ordained for somebody else. Why did God make you the way he did? We often refer to this, that why are you wired the way you are? Why did the creator give you certain skills, but he didn't give you others? I mean, why did he give me an uncle that could play just about any instrument he put his hands on, and I can't hardly play a, a radio? I mean, why? He, and he, and we, by the way, we have the same name. He's Uncle Jack. They always called me Little Jack. Not anymore, not anymore. <laughs> but anyway, why are we like that? Huh? Why do you have inclinations toward particular areas? You find enjoyment there, your, your work and, and your hobbies, all of these kinds. Of, why are you like that? You didn't phone ahead. You didn't fill out a, you know, some kind of a survey before birth saying, would you please? And you fill in the blanks. No, your creator did that. Psalmist said in Psalm 139, what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. See, God's purpose for our life. And right here, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You'll say, but I worked for it. Well, who gave you the skills? Amen. Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the, the health? Who gave you the mind to learn that field, to learn those subjects when you're back in school so that you qualified for that work? Who gave you the health? Because there are people in this world that don't have the physical ability to do those things. Why are you like that? God purposed you, and our purposes differ. But also, God's purpose for each life is important. Again, God does not hand out just wasted assignments. They all have a reason. Now, we got to be careful as human beings sometimes. One of the things we like to do is compare and compete, but we like to compare. And if we're not careful, we might rule out something that God says, hey, that's important. That's why I think maybe the Lord said that the first will be last and the last will be first, you see. Well, Philippians 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Well, now, if, if we're obedient to the Lord and we're in his will, and we're doing his purpose for our lives. Listen, you would have to step back to do something else. You would, you know, or step down. Because what God has purposed you for was his good pleasure. It's like over in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, where he says God has placed you in the body where it has pleased him. Do we want to serve somewhere where it's not pleasing to the Lord? You see? And so it is important. And so therefore, as the Bible tells us, whatever we find our hands to do, we're to do what? Half-heartedly? No, with all our heart, yes. Because we should see what we've been purposed for as a privilege from the Lord. Because we do what we do as unto the Lord. Even in Ephesians 6, Paul, he's speaking to servants there. But he said, what you're doing, he said, don't be men pleasers. Rather, do what you do as unto Christ, you see. That's the way that you sanctify your employment, your work, that what you do, I'm not just working for him, I'm working for him, for the Lord himself. Differ, they're important, but also God's purposes are designed for our mutual benefit. God doesn't just give me a gift for me to relish and to kind of hoard. I was at Dollar General today, stopped there for a moment. This guy walked in and he said, ma'am, do you have any canning jars? I should have got his name. He's a rare breed anymore, probably his wife. But anyway, apparently they're, they were canning something, you know, putting something up. Well, we all, what we do can help and benefit others. And they won't can it, hold on to it, you see. And that's what we can do sometimes if we're not careful. I just want to, in fact, Adrian Rogers, how did he put it? He said, Americans, how did, how did he say it? He said, get all you can, can all you get, 
sit on the lid, poison the rest. They're just selfish. That's not what God intended. God intended for our, our gifts and assignments in life to be a blessing to one another. Right here in 1 Corinthians 12, there are diversity of gifts, different gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all or for the common good. That's why the, body, the Bible emphasizes the body of Christ. We're members of the same body. Many members, many assignments, but one body. What this hand does is to benefit the rest of the body. And yet, the Bible also says, but you know what? If one member suffers, all the other members suffer with it. I know somebody the other day that had a bad toothache. Toothache and earache are two things that you do not just say, oh, I'll, you know, I'll ignore it. <laughs> you don't ignore it. It occupies you. It, it just pulsates and just, oh, my, it hurts. The whole body's affected by that, you know? And when the dentist does whatever needs to be done, the body also benefits from that, right? <sighs> what a relief. I can go and enjoy life. But what you do, what God has called you to do, what God's gifted you and enabled you to do, it'd be a blessing to others. And of course, what goes around comes around. Because Jesus said in Matthew, I believe it's at chapter 6, give and it shall be given unto you. Now note, first there is the initiative of giving. You don't sit back and wait to receive. No, you give. Give and you shall receive. That's why Paul would quote Jesus. We don't have it in the Gospels, but Paul quotes Jesus saying, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I hope you know what Paul's talking about there, that there is a blessing in giving, serving, putting others ahead of yourself. So that, that, that we see that in the characteristics of the season. They, they all have their reason for existence. God designed it the way he did for a purpose, a reason. The same thing is true for us. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. Now, consider how the ceasing of the seasons emphasizes God's sovereignty. You say, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute, you just talked about the continuation has been going on and continues to this very present hour. But they will end. How do I know that? What did Jesus say, or excuse me, what did the Lord say in verse 22? While the earth remains. Well, is, the, is this earth going to remain forever? No, it's not. And in like manner, the seasons are not going to remain forever. But who will remain forever? The Lord God Almighty. He is the eternal one. He has no beginning and he has no ending. Go home and sit on a stump and think about that a little bit. That'll blow your mind. That God had no beginning from eternity past to eternity future. And so God says, well, there is a period for seasons, a time frame, and that is while the earth remains. And that reminds us that God is in charge. In fact, nature, as we call it, reminds us who's in charge, right? I mean, these terrible uh, hurricanes, we, we're quite familiar with them now on the East Coast. You know what? It reminds us we're not in charge. We don't have anything to say about the direction, the velocity. And remember Florence, the speed, like that one they just had down the Gulf Coast. Florence got here and what, just crawled. Same thing down there, they just crawled and dumped all that water. Who determines that? Not us. You see, even creation testifies to God's 
sovereignty. God establishes boundaries. He is the one who says, you can go this far and no further. In creation, look, Psalm 74 and verse 16. The day is yours. The night also is yours. Now, that's also mentioned in our text verse there. The day and night is going to continue. We still have it, don't we? We still, sometime in the evening, you know, you don't say, oh, no, it's getting dark. Like it's a shock. It's, bright. it's coming on. You know it's coming. Next morning, there's a day break at some point. Now, the way everything works, you know, there's the longer daylight period. But, you know, it don't take long the, toward the end of summer. You begin to realize the daylight is getting shorter. It's like every, every day a minute or two. And man, it's not long before it was light at 8.45 and now it's dark at 8.15, you know? But the day and light is still continuing. He says, all right, he said, you have prepared the light and the sun. Now note, you have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. God is sovereign over his creation. This sovereignty also includes you and me. He is sovereign with mankind in that he has set boundaries. Now, way back over in Genesis, he had the boundaries of living a little bit longer, didn't he? I was just reading today, was it Jacob? I think it was Jacob that was 130 years, and the way he was talking, like, I hadn't lived near as long as the others did. <laughs> This is a short span. Man, I, I saw where, was it World War I or World War II? The lady. It was just in the news this week. Did anybody see it? 107 years old. Y'all didn't see that? Oh, thank you, Janelle. Sometimes when nobody agrees with me, it's like I think, I wonder if I'm getting confused here. <laughs> you know, a mental issue here. <laughs> you know, it kind of concerns you sometimes. But yeah, 107. That's rare, isn't it? But God had given us borders and boundaries. Well, now look, Ecclesiastes 8. Because for every matter, there is a time and a judgment. Though the misery of man increases greatly, for he does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? No one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. And no one has power in the day of death. I do believe that you have a moment in time marked. You'll live to then and no further. Now, we never know in the mercies of God of how he has ordered things. We can have maybe the experience like Hezekiah. It looks like we're going to die and the Lord extends our days. But you know what? Hezekiah still died. And we will too. It is appointed unto man once to die. And just as one day, one day there will no longer be seasons because the earth will no longer remain. So one day our season down here is going to expire, right? All right, then also God preserves and limits. He keeps and yet he calls the day. It's by his power. You see, the Bible says in Colossians 1, 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist, or others have, are held together. Now, society right now looks rather crazy, doesn't it? Our society, anyway, here in America, looks very crazy, very chaotic. The fact of the matter is, God is still holding things together. That's why we believe there's coming a time called the tribulation, the great tribulation, There'll be a time where Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, he says, talk about the Holy Spirit, that the one who restrains is going to be taken out. That is his restraining effect, the Holy Spirit. And that's why in the book of Revelations, it really goes bizarre and crazy. Absolutely insane. And the Bible says, except those days had been shortened, that doesn't mean it's less than 24 hours. It means just simply the, the, the time period. If it had gone on and on and on, man would annihilate himself. So if you read the book of Revelation, you see the, the, the overlapping of this thing and that thing of the judgments of God upon it. And man just 
being more like an animal than like a human being. And yet right now, it's being held together because we're more dependent on God than we even appreciate. I believe the Bible says something, they say something to the effect, did not somebody tell an old drunken king one time about his breath? Remember Daniel to Belshazzar? Your breath is in his hands. Man, what's that picture of? He could snuff you out any time he so chose. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere in him we live and move and have our being, our existence? It does. We are, we are utterly, totally dependent upon the care of God. And yet that's again why Jesus said to disciples that day, consider the lilies, consider the sparrows of how our Father takes care of them. Now, birds are not lazy. In fact, some mornings when you're wanting to sleep, you're wishing, could y'all not stay in bed a little bit longer today, you know? Especially old Balkan birds. Man, I tell you what, back in the days when we would sleep with the windows raised, I've, I've been intending to do it. I hadn't done it in this nice, cool weather. I like to do it. But, man, early in the morning, all of a sudden these things start chirping. But you know what? They're up and at it. They labor. Now, the Lord said that they are fed because God provides the worms, right? But they have to go get them, the worms and the bugs and all that. They have to go get them. And yet he said, but God's providing for them. God's caring for them. In like manner, God cares for us. Why do we live upon a planet that has such rich resources? We live in a country. Look, look, look at what we have in this country. Even though farming is not in the top percentage now today of vocations, look at what those who do farm in this country produce. Do you ever stop to think about the volume of something you buy at the grocery store that is required because it's all over the country? Potatoes. As far as I know, they're eating potatoes up north, out west, in every city. Think of all the ways we eat potatoes. Bought few that get cooked at home, a whole bunch of them get eat at Chick-fil-A, all right? Do you know we pulled up at Chick-fil-A the other day and I thought they had closed. There wasn't a car there, the drive through I thought, you, you felt right funny. It was strange. It's always a line of vehicles, you know? French fries. All the French fries we eat. Have you ever thought about what is required to raise the potatoes in this country to feed us? On and on and on you can go. Who gave us that? Who has given us the soil that is so rich and fertile to grow all the things we eat? That is incredible. But his word will endure because here it is. He said, as long as the earth remains, well, look what I said right here, this last verse, Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away. They have a time limit. As if God has a leash on his creation. And one of these days, the leash will reach its limit. And it'll be a day of reckoning, a day of judgment. And this earth, Peter says, is going to melt with a great heat. It'll be over. Now, Revelation tells us what? A new heaven and a new earth. But the Lord says here, but my words will by no means pass away. Do you know the Bible says that God has exalted his word above his name? His word is is so important to him. We live in a society where a man's word is no longer his bond. There was a time when that was the case. Anything you do today of any kind of finances or whatever, look at all the papers you sign, trying to get people really, you know, obligated there that are going to follow through with it. God's word, if you please, is his bond. His word will by no means pass away. So that day's coming. His word will be fulfilled, as we just saw this past Sunday. But 
the Lord here is saying something to us that we need to think about every now. That's just like the other, the other day, I was, I was on the mower, I didn't even realize, didn't even see it, and here my brother comes walking over with his phone, and he had taken a picture, and there was a, a rainbow as he was looking from his house back toward our house, you know, over. Well, when do we really think about the rainbow and what God said it means? That the rainbow is a promise what? No more flood. Global flood. Yeah, no more. Now there's local flooding, but not worldwide global flooding. But when's the last time I looked at that and thought, instead of thinking about the people who've robbed the colors of the rainbow, why not I think about instead the God who put that thing in place just to, hey, I just want to remind you, I keep my word. I'm going to do what I said. He didn't have to give us a rainbow. He didn't have to make the laws in creation whereby the sun going through uh, the water drops give you that. But he did. So all around us all the time, there's these little things that are not really all that little that are very important. And we're in one right now, the transition. I think, was it was yesterday on the calendar, first day of fall? Yeah. So we've transitioned out of summer officially but we have really transitioned out of it, you know, literally with the thermometer and it feels wonderful. But it's a reminder, hey, in a sense, we shouldn't be surprised. It's what God did. But yet at the same time, we should stand in awe of our creator. So that's the thought for this evening. Anybody like to share a comment on the subject? We can sure thank the Lord. You don't have to turn the air conditioning on as much, right? That's nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, yes. Tell her she can, she can hear it online if she has that access. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, do pray for her. That's, again, when you're in the midst of something, that season's like it's going to never change. But it will. Okay. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, thank you for what we sometimes might think is something simple or even small, but it's not. It is something you've put right before us to feel, to see, to experience. That this reality is so fixed, so established by you that we can learn even from the seasons if we will take time to consider. May more uh, lessons, more perspectives perhaps come forward uh, this week to these dear folks as they think on these things and ponder it. And Lord, what, what you're teaching us, what you're saying, what you're reminding us of, just going out of summer into fall, and no, hey, winter's right ahead. It reminds us of some important things that we need to have in our lives when our circumstances, not the seasons, but our circumstances, situations, when things change or when it seems they will never go away, whatever it might be. Bless this one that Evelyn spoke of. It is so easy to um, speak from a distance, but oh Lord, we pray for your, your grace to hold on to the promises and the precepts of your word. Now Lord, it could be that, that the season will not end until death, but it's gonna end. And we shall, Paul said it writing from a prison. He, he said be, to be with Christ will be better. And so Lord, may we be a people now who truly do walk by faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, good night.